This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Your Royal Highness and Chancellor, colleagues, fellows of the Institute, students, and many friends of the Institute who are, who are here uh, this evening, let me offer a warm welcome to all of you um, who have come today for this very special event, and a special welcome to you, ma'am, um, for having found time in your diary to, to join us. We all appreciate your commitment every year as Chancellor of the University of London, but this evening is an even more special event than usual. Uh, it's the launch of the Institute's Diamond Jubilee Seminar Series. I've been fascinated by the programme for the series. It promises a powerful scholarly examination of the role of the monarchy and its relationship with the contemporary Commonwealth, including re reflections on how that relationship has changed during the long reign of Her Majesty the Queen. The four seminars are on an intriguing set of subjects, and they boast some very significant names um, coming as speakers for the events and also as moderators. And indeed, looking at some of the pairings of names, I guess that the moderating influence of the moderators might be quite needed for some of the events. I'd encourage everyone here this evening to, make as many, to, 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 to attend as many of the seminars as possible. And ma'am, if you find yourself at a loose end on one of the evenings, <laughs> do feel free to drop in. The Diamond Jubilee Seminar Series is an opportunity for the Institute of Commonwealth Studies to demonstrate some of the breadth of knowledge and expertise that it has within its ranks and amongst its circle of friends and supporters. The Institute's prestigious events program has welcomed major figures, uh, Justice Alvy Sachs, Peter Hay, Tony Benn, many others. It organizes some hundred events each year on themes such as the Commonwealth, decolonization, human rights, global governance, and much else. As some of you may know, during this year, 2012, the School of Advanced Study, in which the Institute of Commonwealth Studies sits as one of ten institutes, the School of Advanced Study will be reviewed by its main funder, the Higher Education Funding Council for England. Five years after the last review, we're very confident of showing its success, the success of all the institutes, in facilitating and promoting research nationally and internationally, which is the main purpose which it is funded, and ensuring the good dissemination of that research for policy making and beyond. The Institute of Commonwealth Studies is a dynamic exponent of both those roles, the promotion of research around the country and beyond, and also the dissemination of it to policy makers. And I think the seminar series that will follow this introductory event is, is testimony to just that. Let me explain briefly the plan for the evening. I shall shortly invite Professor Philip Murphy, director of the Institute, uh, to speak. And he will be followed by Chief Amika Anyoku, Commonwealth Secretary General between 1990 and 2000. And, if I may add, a graduate of the University of London through the external system, um, now known as International Programmes. But let me note the importance of the external system of International Programmes to the Commonwealth. Since Mauritius provided the very first students outside Britain, to study for University of London degrees in the 1880s, in the 1880s, to the recent founding of the University of the Seychelles from roots in working with the external system over many, many years. The Commonwealth has been fundamental uh, to, international, to the external system, what we now know as international programs. Student of international, students of international programs come from all over the world, but I've been struck uh, by just how important the Commonwealth is among them. And the next contributor will be Chinui Chikwobo Roy, MBE, uh, the distinguished Nigerian portrait artist, uh, who will discuss uh, with Philip Murphy a portrait of Her Majesty the Queen as head of the Commonwealth, which, have, which was commissioned as part of the Golden Jubilee celebrations and unveiled in 2002. I shall then finally invite the Chancellor to offer some concluding remarks of her own. Finally, before handing over to Professor Murphy, let me just offer a few words of, of thanks to the staff of the Institute who've put so much work into this series. Stuart Mole, the senior research fellow, himself a distinguished player in Commonwealth affairs over the years. Olga Jimenez, the events manager, and of course, Philip, Philip Murphy himself. But above all, may I thank you, ma'am, for joining us this evening 
and for making the inauguration of the Diamond Jubilee Seminar Series such a very special event. I now invite the Director of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies to speak, Philip. Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, may I offer you my warmest welcome to the Institute of Common Studies. I'm delighted that so many of you have been able to join us for this very special occasion. It's a particular honour and privilege to be able to welcome the Chancellor here this evening. Her Royal Highness's visit provides an opportunity to celebrate the long and distinguished history of the Institute, and in doing so we've sought to gather together current and former students and staff fellows, associates, and friends of the Institute. As such, this is very much a, a family affair for us. But we also felt that this would be a suitable occasion to launch our year-long series of events examining the relationship between the Crown and the Commonwealth to mark the Diamond, Diamond Jubilee of Her Majesty the Queen. Uh, I would like to endorse uh, Jeff thanks to my colleague student, Stuart Merle, and to Olga Menes for helping to organize this. It's also a great pleasure to be able to welcome to the Institute Chief Emeka Yuku and uh, Chinwei uh, Chukuku Roy. Uh, Chief Anyuku will be familiar to all of you. A distinguished Nigerian diplomat and a graduate of this university, as Jeff mentioned. He joined the Commonwealth Secretariat in 1966, only a year after its establishment, and rose through the organization to become its Secretary General in 1990. He guided it through a momentous decade in its history, which was witnessed the Harare Declaration, the advent of majority rule in South Africa, and the establishment in 1995 of the Commonwealth Ministerial Action Group. Uh, Chinwe uh, Chukugu Roy was born in Nigeria, uh, but has lived in the UK since 1975. She's an internationally celebrated artist with strong links to the Institute and to the broader Commonwealth family. In 1999, she was commissioned by the Nigerian government to produce a portrait of Chief Anyuku. Two years later, she won the commission to produce the Golden Jubilee portrait of the Queen, which now hangs in Barbara House. She held a major exhibition in 2003 to coincide with the Queen's visit to the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in the Bruja, uh, for which she produced a portrait of Chief of Sanjo, President of Nigeria. The Institute is lucky enough to have a number of her works on display, so like Chief Anyuku, she feels very much a part of our extended family. May I say a few brief words about the Institute of Commonwealth Studies itself? The Institute provides a unique focal point for scholars in the UK, and indeed across the world, with an interest in the Commonwealth. In recent years, it's been enriched by its association with the nine other institutes which make up the School of Advanced Study. It plays an active role in the broader activities of this extremely important institution dedicated to promoting and facilitating research in the arts and humanities. And we're very pleased to have uh, the Dean of the School, Professor Roger Kane, with us this evening. Like the School of Advanced Study, the institute itself has, from the very beginning, been interdisciplinary in character, bringing together scholars from a range of backgrounds, including history, political science, and economics. In its early years, it seems to have generated a certain amount of alarm. It was explained at the Committee of Management of the Institute in June 1950 that interdisciplinary uh, was a phrase, quote, of American origin. Um, Seminars of this nature were, it was noted, a rather a new experiment in this country. And some anxiety was expressed about the difficulties of inducing members of staff to participate in them regularly. Uh, well, no such difficulties now, I'd like to say. The Institute is home to the Ameka Anyuku Chair in Commonwealth Studies, the only such chair in the United Kingdom. And so it's particularly gratifying that Chief Anyuku is able to join us in person on this occasion. A particular area of strength for the Institute is the study of human rights. We offer an extremely popular master's degree in understanding and securing human rights, which this year had a cohort of 50 students. 
In addition to our MA teaching, the Institute has been supervising PhD students throughout its 63 years of its existence. It's a great pleasure to be able to welcome some of our former students back to the Institute today, many of whom have gone on to distinguished careers in academia and in many areas of private uh, and public sector work. An integral part of the Institute is our think tank, the Commonwealth Advisory Bureau, which the Commonwealth Secretary General recently described as, quote, a generator of initiatives and ideas for the Commonwealth family. Quote. If the history of the relationship between the Crown and the Commonwealth is one of adaptation to meet the challenges of a changing world, so too is the history of the Institute itself. The idea of such a unit within the University of London was first suggested during the Second World War by the Secretary of State for India, Leo Amory. Amory's notion was of, quote, a school or institute of empire studies. And indeed, it was under the title of Institute of Empire Studies that in October 1948, the University of London Senate finally approved its creation. Two months later, however, the University's Special Advisory Board on Colonial Studies, quote, decided that in view of recent developments in the political sphere, it would be more appropriate if the title of the proposed institute were Institutes of Commonwealth Studies instead of the Institute of Empire Studies. And it was under this revised title that the institute came into existence <coughs> under the directorship of Professor Keith Hancock in October 1949. The mention of recent developments in the political sphere no doubt referred above all to India's independence in August 1947 and its immediate consequences for the Commonwealth. Up to that point, common allegiance to the Crown had been the essential factor that bound Commonwealth members together. With the new government of India determined to become a republic, the question arose as to whether this could be reconciled with its continued membership of the Commonwealth. A compromise was finally reached in the form of the London Declaration of April 1949, which spoke of India's, quote, acceptance of the King as a symbol of the free association of its independent member nations, and as such, head of the Commonwealth. Quote. The Declaration is often seen as the point at which the modern Commonwealth was born. By securing India's continued membership, it shifted the centre of gravity of the Commonwealth, ensuring that it would become increasingly a champion of the interests of its citizens in the developing world, a trend that was reinforced by rapid decolonisation in the 1950s and 60s. As many of those newly independent countries followed India in becoming republics, the Declaration opened the way for the position we have today, in which only a minor minority of Commonwealth members, 16 out of 54, have the Queen as their sovereign. The remainder simply recognised her as head of the Commonwealth. Yet anyone who witnessed the extraordinarily warm reception which the Queen received when she visited Perth last year for the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting would be able to testify to her role both within the Commonwealth realms and the broader Commonwealth remains of huge significance. This owes much to her profound personal commitment to the Commonwealth, which she famously signalled in the broadcast she made on her 21st birthday in 1947, and which has been a distinguishing feature of her 60-year reign. The relationship between the Crown and the Commonwealth has long been a highly complex and multifaceted issue. Indeed, it's almost been a job creation scheme for constitutional lawyers and pundits. Over the course of this year, through our special seminar series, the Institute of Commonwealth Studies will explore some of these questions. They will include the nature of the hedge of the Commonwealth. The title head of the Commonwealth was created less than three years before Her Majesty the Queen succeeded to the throne. The nature of the role was intentionally left vague and lacking in constitutional substance. That the headship has become such a concrete and significant part of the modern Commonwealth is due in large part to the Queen's own efforts to give it substance. And we will be exploring this issue in greater detail in our series. Another aspect of this question is the monarch's relationship with our other Commonwealth realms. From the interwar period onwards, they developed the notion that the Commonwealth brought together a series of quite distinct kingdoms, that the monarch 
was as much sovereign as of Canada or New Zealand as they were of the UK. As such, they would act on the advice of their respective prime ministers in respect to each realm. But that, of course, raised new questions. Were there occasions when the monarch should seek the advice of more than one, or indeed all of their Commonwealth prime ministers? And what if that advice should conflict? We saw a recent example of the complexities generated by this arrangement at the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting in Perth, where David Cameron sought and obtained agreement from the Prime Ministers of all the Commonwealth realms to change the laws uh, of succession. <coughs> While all these and other questions are likely to provide fertile ground for academic discussion for many years to come, the presence of the Chancellor this evening is a reminder of how much practical benefit Britain and the Commonwealth continues to derive from the royal family. The Princess Royal's remarkably extensive program of official duties were frequently taken her to other parts of the Commonwealth. Indeed, if I might be allowed to strike a, a personal note, one of the first occasions I can remember being aware of an African Commonwealth country, the Royal Highness, was when you visited Kenya in 1971 in the company of the, the surrogate mother of British children of my generation, Valerie Singleton. Um, and an episode that featured prominently in my copy of the, the 1972 Blue Peter Annual. <laughs> it was therefore particularly fascinating recently to read a Foreign Office file on, on that visit in the National Archive. Princess Anne was visiting Kenya in her capacity as president of the Save the Children Fund. And the Prince of Wales, Prince Charles, was also visiting Kenya at the same time. Among the documents in the file was an account of the visit by the British High Commissioner, Eric Norris. Norris recorded, quote, I'm sure the warmth accorded to the Prince of Wales and Princess Anne was largely due to the personal impact they had on those they met. Stories of their friendly and informal style spread rapidly and were remembered with advantage and still are." Unquote. The informality was all the more remarkable for the fact that neighboring Uganda had just experienced the coup that brought Eddie Idi Amin to power. Norris noted that, quote, with revolution next door, the heir to the throne was calmly wandering around the wildest parts of Kenya, guarded only against the possibility of attack by elephant, lion, or rhino. <laughs> this theme of the goodwill generated by the friendliness and informality of royal visits emerges from official documents relating to many other Commonwealth tours. In May 1970, for example, Britain's High Commissioner in Canberra compared the recent visits to Australia by the Prince of Wales, Princess Anne, and the Queen to an earlier one by the President of the United States, Lyndon Johnson. He noted that, quote, the fact that the sovereign and the royal family can circulate in crowded cities virtually unprotected had contrasted sharply with, quote, President Johnson's trotting secret servicemen and the bullhorn voice from the armored limousine, unquote. We're delighted that the Chancellor has agreed to say a few words about the role of the royal family in the Commonwealth. Before she does so, I will be talking to Chinway about the challenges of portraying the Queen's Commonwealth Row in art. First, however, we will be hearing from someone who's witnessed the Queen's Commonwealth role at first hand. Your Royal Highness, Vice Chancellor, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Chief Emeka and your crew. Your Royal Highness, Chancellor, the Vice-Chancellor, the Director, Philip Murphy of the Institute of Commonwealth Studies, ladies and gentlemen, my first words must be to say how delighted I am to be here this evening. You have heard <coughs> about my long-standing connections with the University of London and my particular affinity with the Institute 
of Commonwealth Studies. It is for me a special honor to have to speak in the presence of Her Royal Highness, the Princess Royal. If I may be permitted a, a little personal digression, before I became Commonwealth Secretary General, I had the pleasant privilege of serving on the board of Save the Children Fund under the presidency of Her Royal Highness and also of co-editing a book that was published by the Save the Children Fund on the impact of poverty on African children. But I've been asked by Philip Murphy to speak this evening about the role of Her Majesty the Queen as head of the Commonwealth. In addressing my topic, I think I should start from the London Declaration of 1949, to which reference has been made by Philip Murphy in his uh, remarks. The London Declaration of 1949, as you had Philip say, arose from the fact that India, the newly independent country of India, wanted to become a republic and at the same time wanted to remain in the Commonwealth. And so raised the question of the compatibility of republicanism with Commonwealth membership. And in the end, the solution that was found was, as was mentioned by Philip, the London Declaration of 1949, in which India recognized and accepted this king King George VI, as the symbol of the free association of its independent member nations and as such head of the Commonwealth. But there was also a second element to this London Declaration, and that involved changing the name from the British Commonwealth to the Commonwealth of Nations. This notion, this concept of equality among members of the Commonwealth was subsequently, 16 years later, concretized in the establishment of the Commonwealth Secretariat as a collective independent instrument of the Commonwealth. And indeed, some in advocating the change from British Commonwealth to the Commonwealth of Nations, had had in mind the existence of the Commonwealth of Australia, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts in the United States, and that necessitated their thinking that the Commonwealth of Nations would be the most appropriate way to describe the Commonwealth. So it was under the terms of the London Declaration of 1949 that Her Majesty the Queen became the head of the Commonwealth in 1952, following the death of her father, King George VI. This year, 2012, we'll see the Queen's Diamond Jubilee. The last 60 years of her reign and her headship of the Commonwealth has witnessed a number of challenges and a number of testing times. Testing times to the Commonwealth and to the headship of the Commonwealth. Perhaps I would like at the beginning of this seminar series to highlight three characteristics of the headship of the Commonwealth provided by the Queen. The first characteristic 
is what I would describe as the enlarging role of the Queen. When the Queen came to the throne, Commonwealth Prime Minister's meetings were intimate occasions held exclusively in London or in the UK. As the Commonwealth grew, the idea of rotating the venues for Commonwealth meetings came on. And indeed, the first Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting to be held outside the United Kingdom was held in my own country, Nigeria, in Lagos in 1966. And until then, and uh, in the years after that, the role of the Queen was slightly limited. Limited to the fact that uh, at heads of government meetings, she visited the conference venue, and then she had meetings with individual heads of government. But this was outside the formal meetings of heads of government. But this enlarging role changed in 1997 when the Queen, for the first time, formally opened the meetings of heads of government. I recall that uh, when I suggested the idea to Commonwealth heads of government, they all readily, readily warmed up to the idea. And so in Edinburgh, Her Majesty opened in a formal sense the meeting of Commonwealth heads. And that tradition has continued ever since. I think also I'd like to say that as her role as head of the Commonwealth enlarged, there were distinct roles that she played in her capacity as the sovereign of the United Kingdom and in her capacity as head of the Commonwealth. When in 1971, for example, Prime Minister Ted Heath advised the Queen in his capacity as the British Prime Minister not to go to the Commonwealth Summit in Singapore. I witnessed the unhappiness among Commonwealth heads of government that Her Majesty was not in Singapore. And this was contrasted years later in 1979 when Commonwealth Summit took place in Lusaka. At that time, Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher also sought to discourage Her Majesty from going to Lusaka. Indeed, I recall that Prime Minister Bob Muldoon of New Zealand had come to London, had lunch with Margaret Thatcher at 10 Downing Street, and after the lunch, addressed the press and expressed grave concern about the safety and security of uh, Her Majesty as Queen of New Zealand in Lusaka, pointing in the direction of discouraging Her Majesty from going to Lusaka. But in quite unprecedented way, that same evening, a statement from Buckingham Palace said, that it remained Her Majesty's firm intention to go to Lusaka. And there she went. And in Lusaka, this meeting was a meeting at a very crucial moment in the evolution of the Commonwealth. Because the Commonwealth in 79 was on the brink because of the crisis in Rhodesia. And this was why Prime Minister Margaret Thatcher sought to discourage Her Majesty from going. But Her Majesty's presence in Lusaka was in fact what clinched the agreement 
among Commonwealth heads of government. It was, as far as I could remember, the only summit meeting where, unlike the others, Her Majesty would leave after the banquet and reception with foreign ministers and others, would leave the venue by about half past 10, 11 in Lusaka. She remained at the venue till slightly after midnight, talking to every single head of government and talking to all those who advised them. And the result of that was that the crisis which had uh, loomed large over the Commonwealth was uh, resolved by her presence. And the second characteristic I'd like to talk about is that although the London Declaration spoke about the monarch as the symbol of the free association, Her Majesty the Queen has been more than a symbol of unity. She's always, she has always been very conscious of the collective relationship between Commonwealth countries. And as I said, in the case of uh, uh, Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe, her presence helped to resolve the crisis. And also, in the case of South Africa, when the debate was very intense as to whether there should be Commonwealth sanctions against South Africa or not, and there was a very uh, clear division of opinion within the Commonwealth on that, it was Her Majesty whose informal interventions helped to create some solidarity within the Commonwealth. And this is why some have wondered about the special relationship between President Nelson Mandela, former President Nelson Mandela, and Her Majesty the Queen. I think Mandela, like all the other heads of Commonwealth government, and all the other leaders in South Africa, appreciated the special sympathy of Her Majesty the Queen for the change in South Africa. And then, of course, the Queen relates, speaks to the Commonwealth. She makes her Christmas broadcasts. She delivers special Commonwealth Day messages. And she has twice addressed the United Nations General Assembly as not only the Queen and Sovereign of the United Kingdom, but also as the head of the Commonwealth. And this brings me to the third characteristic I'd like to talk about, and that is that Her Majesty, over the last 60 years, has lived for all the Commonwealth, not just the United Kingdom. She has unrivaled knowledge of Commonwealth heads of government. She has, uh, uh, I can't quite remember the number of British Prime Ministers that she has seen come and go. And she has seen a number of Commonwealth heads of government come and go. And she has related to all of them. She understands their preoccupations and, uh, and uh, fountain of knowledge in continuity throughout the uh, Commonwealth. And she also, more than it's often appreciated, is aware of the Commonwealth as not just an association of governments, but also an association of the peoples of the Commonwealth. And that's why she seeks in her tours of Commonwealth countries to relate to the people. And uh, in her 
recent statement, she said that the real soul, and here I'd like to quote her, the real soul of the Commonwealth, the motor, the drive, is provided by people within and without those governments. It is people who run the non-governmental associations, people who become architects and engineers, journalists and teachers, people who elect their governments, the more the activities of the Commonwealth bring direct benefits to its peoples, the stronger the organizations will be. And that's why when she tours Commonwealth countries, we had a reference to her visit to, Cape, uh, to um, Australia uh, from Philip Murphy. And I recall uh, when in 1956, I was then an undergraduate at University College of Ibadan, an external university uh, uh, college of London at the time, when the Queen and His Royal Highness Prince Philip visited Nigeria. And um, I remember that Prince Philip came uh, to our university and uh, played cricket with those of us who played cricket. And the reception that Her Majesty received in the country was something that I have uh, a memory that I have continued to cherish for a long time. And as you know, the Queen was in Australia just a few months ago for the biennial summit meeting of the Commonwealth. Um, we refer to it as Chugum. And as Philip Morphy mentioned, this Chugum in Perth saw for the first time a meeting of the 16 heads, 16 prime ministers who are, uh, who constitute the realms of, of Her Majesty the Queen. And it was at that meeting that uh, agreement was reached by the 16 on uh, the succession, rules of succession in this country, which would provide for equal treatment of male and female and also lift the bar against the monarch marrying a Roman Catholic. The Queen opened the birth um, job and being very conscious of the eminent persons group report on the future of the Commonwealth which was due to be considered the following day, she in her address said, and I quote, in agreeing for the reforms that respond boldly to the aspirations of today and keep the Commonwealth fresh and fit for tomorrow. This was the message that she delivered to the heads of government. And let me say that her role, because of her role, there is great affection and great respect for Her Majesty the Queen throughout the Commonwealth. If I may just give you an illustration of this. In 1997, when the Queen and Prince Philip were to celebrate their golden wedding jubilee, I proposed to <coughs> Commonwealth heads of government that they might want to make modest uh, contributions to mark the celebration of the Golden Jubilee. I was astonished by the response. The response that came in was so overwhelming that after the official gift, which was the Tresillion now at St. George's Hall at Windsor, there was surplus. The surplus made it possible for the commissioning of Her Majesty's portrait, which uh, 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 Chihuahua Karoi uh, uh, painted. And even after that, the surplus allowed us to commission two other paintings of two birds chosen by Her Majesty and Prince Philip. 
a golden oriole and a peacock. These were presented to her, uh, to them, by heads of government in celebration of their golden jubilee. And in 2002, when the Queen celebrated her 50th anniversary on the throne and as head of the Commonwealth, I was asked for a treatment. And I said this, she has been more than a visible symbol of a free association of nations. She has soothed its tempers, bound its wounds, encouraged its growth, and at certain times and in her own way, stilled its resolve. For her guidance and unwavering commitment, we are deeply in her debt. This was what I said in 2002, and today, that is as true as it ever was. And there is nothing that I would want to add except to jubilate that a queen and a head of the Commonwealth, which we know is worth more than gold, should this year, above all, sparkle in diamonds. <laughs> and if I may end up, I'd like to say this for myself, that the centrality and significance of the role of the monarch in the Commonwealth, especially over the last 60 years, has been such that whenever the time for succession comes, all that the Commonwealth Secretary General will need to do should, in my view, be to inform all Commonwealth leaders that in keeping with the London Declaration of 1949, the headship of the association will continue in the successor to Her Majesty the Queen. I thank you. And thank you for introducing our, our, next, our next item, um, which is uh, uh, an interview with uh, Chin Wei uh, about the Golden uh, Jubilee portrait, which we have um, reproduced here uh, in the corner. And Chin Wei has very kindly um, uh, <coughs> produced these lovely uh, brochures uh, for you to take back with you as a, as a uh, uh, remembrance of today's, today's events and it uh, uh, may be helpful for you to refer to them when we're, when we're talking. So, uh, Chima, let me, let me begin. Can we discuss a little bit about the, the background to the Commission um, to produce this Jubilee portrait? I mean, how did you win the commission, and what was its nature? Which is to say, was it specifically to depict the Queen as head of the Commonwealth? Um, how did I win the commission? It's quite difficult because I wasn't in the deciding panel. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I remember being asked um, to put in my portfolio for um, a portrait to paint the Queen. And uh, I thought, looked around, thinking somebody else was being asked the question. And I uh, realized it was me. I'm thinking, me, yes. So I brought my portfolio in and decided to forget about it completely. And um, because being asked, I just felt really honored. And I didn't want the disappointment, not getting it. But to my great amazement, I, was, I got it. And um, when I was given the letter from the Queen saying that I'd been chosen, my son described my feelings. He said, Mommy jumped up and rubbed and tackled everybody in the room. <laughs> <laughs> I was so excited. 
Um, now, it wasn't quite specific. It was just to paint a portrait of the queen to replace um, a portrait they had the Commonwealth have in their uh, conference hall. And that was on loan from, I think, Australia, New Zealand, somewhere like that. And um, so it was entirely up to me to um, make something that is suitable for the Commonwealth. And how do you go about preparing for a portrait? <coughs> and did your, did your approach to this commission differ from the way you've approached earlier portraits? <coughs> Um, not particularly, it didn't, it didn't differ that much. This particular portrait is life-size, so the canvas is huge. Now, I had the option of taking the canvas to Buckingham Palace, and I was going to be allowed to come in any time I wanted to paint. Now, being that I live in Suffolk, it presented a problem, because um, as a mother as well, I do wake up in the night and go and paint in my studio. So um, I decided to have the large portrait at home. So the preparation for this was to make sure I had the materials ready for that size canvas. Um, but I had to get smaller canvases, which were my study canvases, and take them into Buckingham Palace uh, on the sitting days. So get information onto the canvas if I was doing the face or the hands or the feet. Uh, onto whichever canvas I took in and um, do my drawings, so I had to get all the drawing books and everything. So technically, that was the preparation for uh, <coughs> painting that, and I'd used that in other portraits that were at that size. What sort, of, what sort of research did you undertake? I mean, did you, for example, look at uh, earlier portraits of the Queen? Were you influenced by them? And did you do any Research on the Commonwealth itself. I did a lot of research on the Commonwealth and um, thinking, well, you know, that would be the topic of discussion. So I read a lot and researched a lot and thought I was very knowledgeable of the Commonwealth. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with looking at the pictures, I was very keen to do that. And when I started looking, I realized, I looked at 10, 11, I realized there was like um, 140 more to look at. I decided, um, no, I'd better just think to myself what I wanted to do and approach it in my own way. And um, had, you know, created ideas of what I wanted, you know, how I wanted that to stand or where I wanted that to stand and background. So, in effect, I didn't want to confuse myself too much with looking at uh, too many portraits. So. How did you decide on a, a visual representation of the Queen's role in the Commonwealth? Um, was, this, was this influenced by your personal impressions and memories of the Queen? Could you could just say a little bit more about the, the picture itself. Um, I think most of what you see was once I was in Buckingham Palace, once she was sitting for me, Basically, having done my research with the portraits and looking at other portraits and thinking, you know, I had to do it myself. It's funny, when you, when you read newspaper articles or books or whatever about somebody, especially about the Queen, there's always extremes. But invariably, you absorb all these things. And I had images of the Queen from what I've read about her before going in. So my idea of what I wanted to paint, which was a queen, the queen, so this queen was just a queen without being a person. Um, when I went in the first sitting, honestly, it just changed my mind completely. Because first of all, um, she was telling anecdotes some funny anecdotes. And afterwards, I realized she was trying to help me to relax. At first, when she, when she was doing this, I was looking thinking, well, she's the queen. I shouldn't laugh. She's <laughs> so, I, mean, I mean, if I laugh, I may be doing the wrong things. And 
I did, in the end, tears streaming down my face when she sort of stopped. And I, I really felt welcomed. I felt at home when I was able to do my work um, really well. So invariably, my work was informed by what I saw on the day, what I saw in her as opposed to an idea I'd come into the sittings with. Tell us something about those elements that you included in this, the things in the, in the background. Yeah, with, um, when I say study canvases for the big canvas, that is the finished painting. And that's what um, they have at the, at the at Marlborough House, the Marlborough Secretariat. The one at the far, head, the far end is pencil sketch. Usually when I um, do portraits, I have to do very, very quick sketches because it concentrates my mind and helps me focus on what I'm doing. So I do very quick sketches of a minute, two minutes, and the longest would be five minutes if I get to that. It fully concentrates my mind. I think that one at the end was probably a couple of minutes to, to get that. Um, so that's one of the drawings. You can imagine with five sittings, there were so many drawings if I did uh, a million drawings. And the middle one, it says study canvas, and that's a smaller canvas um, of her bust. Now all these studies I did, in fact there are some more in the leaflets and much more at home, but the studies I did to take back to work onto the canvas with because I couldn't take the big canvas with me every day to Buckingham Palace. I took smaller canvases, got information onto that, took that home to work in my studio on the bigger canvas. So this, that is the finished painting. That one was standing in my studio. I took it into Buckingham Palace just the once because I wanted to make sure that what I'm putting on the canvas is actually what I'm seeing uh, in front of me. Can you say a little bit, finally, about how the portrait was received and uh, what sort of reactions? <laughs> that, that was incredible. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of media frenzy, <laughs> I expect. Um, it, it was reported worldwide. And just having the reports coming in, I'm thinking, goodness me, yeah, uh, so many thousands, the media, newspapers, yeah, everybody talking about it. Um, there were one or two negative comments. <laughs> you take the good and the bad, and so long as the good outweighs the bad, you know, you get on with it. Because everybody has their opinion of important people. And in fact, something that, um, which the chief touched on during the sitting, <laughs> she is the Commonwealth. She just embodies of the Commonwealth. And when I, want, when I started the painting with my idea, I just wanted a plain background with her dignified in front of it. By the second sitting, it had to be the Commonwealth. And that's why I've placed her surrounded by images of some of the important structures from the Commonwealth. There was no separating her from that. And I made sure that came through. Oh, the other thing I observed so much about her, she has so much warmth, and she's funny, and highly intelligent, and very dignified. And I wanted to the portrait to show this, to show this person that I didn't read about in the newspapers. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much for that. Thank you for thank you for coming. <laughs>
exploring is it does the relationship between the monarchy and the Commonwealth and to our previous speakers for helping uh, to set us on our way. It certainly um, set me thinking and reminded me of a, a whole lot of things which I, and I'd better not include, otherwise you'll be here a lot longer than you um, had originally intended. Uh, well, I hope Professor Mercer, you've got your blue beater badge, because no doubt you've contributed in some way to raiding somebody's attic to give something to Blue Peter in order to help save the children in, in that very good work. <laughs> <laughs> um, the school was Sterehe. Sterehe uh, is said children no longer has a direct relationship. We still fundraise for it. Uh, it's taken um, 40 years to get a, an equivalent girls' school to the boys' school that you raise the money for, but it now exists. Um, so that was a long time ago. But it introduced me very much to the values of the Commonwealth, although I have to say my initial um, introduction to the Commonwealth was a little earlier than that. Um, but then I was only three and a, three quarters and I went to Malta, so that probably doesn't count. But I think we grew up, uh, if not actually what you would call in a multicultural environment, certainly with exposure to a multicultural environment, thanks to the Commonwealth because it was all around us, um, because there was so much discussion, there were visits and visitors. So that had quite an impact on, on all of us in, uh, as we grew up and as we started to travel, as we did in uh, uh, that visit to Kenya, and being introduced to those characters who were so important in evolving um, the Commonwealth and our relationships not least of all, the, the pleasure of meeting uh, Jomo Kenyatta uh, on that visit, uh, which now I regard as really a, a highlight of my um, life, because that was such, such an important individual, uh, not just to Kenya, but to the uh, Commonwealth for the impact that he made. Fascinating character, and it's been a pleasure to meet some of those, although obviously not in the same way that uh, Her Majesty has had. Because those visits, and um, many of the family have had opportunities to maintain the relationship with the Commonwealth in a number of different countries. You don't have the opportunity uh, that the Queen has at the biannual meetings of the Commonwealth Heads of Government to keep that contact with the leaders in, in those countries in a way which is unique, I think, in any other form. It doesn't happen in any other grouping. It doesn't happen even in the United Nations in that way. It's that. Uh, degree of informality about that meetings and the fact that people meet on a very equal basis uh, within the Commonwealth meetings. And for her it's a perspective which is, is unique to those leaders. Uh, as you mentioned over the passage of time, patently that makes a difference, but you see changes not just in the political but also in the social <coughs> uh, uh, aspects of those countries. And I think above all, we have an opportunity to see much more of the similarities across the Commonwealth when so often what is highlighted is the differences and the problems that they face and yet what is so positive and offers such a constructive approach is the similarities and accepting those and building on those. But so much has changed in other ways too. I certainly I suspect Her Majesty finds visiting Commonwealth countries a lot more um, convenient and easy than it was in her early days. Although even then, modern communications have enabled the visits to become uh, more frequent and extensive, although in a slightly different way. The, the Commonwealth tour that Her Majesty conducted following her coronation, uh, she actually became the first reigning British monarch to visit Australia and New Zealand. And that, of course, was a combination of the ability to fly a lot further, but the sea had a lot to do with this too, and that uh, your ability to visit places in greater comfort. So this, as we've been reminded today, but the Darn and Jubilee really does provide an opportunity to look again, to reaffirm that uh, relationship between the royal family and the Commonwealth. And that happily is also being, being encouraged through all members of the family being able to carry out a series of visits on behalf of Her Majesty because it would be, I think, a little optimistic to expect Her Majesty to visit uh, all the Commonwealth countries uh, in this year. Actually, I don't think any of us are going to be able to do, to fulfill that role, but 
I think many of them will remind us of past associations. And the Duke of Kent has one of the longest um, associations because he will be visiting Uganda 50 years after he served as the Queen's representative at that country's independence celebrations in 1962. Now I know he's delighted to be able to do that because for him too, that maintains a connection which is a very unique one. And uh, he very much looks forward to doing that. Among some of the countries that I'm be able to visit, I, I'm going to Zambia. Um, and although I didn't uh, um, give Zambia its independence because I was a little young, um, 1964, uh, the Queen was represented by Princess Mary, who was, of course, a previous member of the family to hold the title of Princess Royal. Um, I suspect I may find one or two people in Zambia who will remember <laughs> when I was there in 1964. <laughs> I shan't know quite whether to say, actually, that wasn't me. <laughs> Just um, move on, because oddly enough, it happens. And it happens in this country, never mind anywhere else. It's a transferable title. It's ageless in that sense, I suppose I have to say. Um, the Queen visited Zambia in 1979. We've been reminded of the importance of that particular heads of government meeting. And that so was an important moment in transfer of power in Zimbabwe. Um, and these visits, visits remind us of current issues and challenges, because I'm going to be able to go to Mozambique. Uh, I have been to Mozambique on a number of occasions uh, since the end of its civil war. But I'm going, looking forward to returning uh, this summer, because Mozambique is a recent addition to the Commonwealth family. And it was the first a country which had no previous constitutional links with the United Kingdom. Um, I would have to, constitutional links, but it had a very important link, uh, and you, know, you will recognize this because uh, from your Save the Children days, but Save the Children was asked by the Mozambique government to help them after the Civil War, and two other major organizations. And I hope that that experience also helped them to feel that there was something really strong about that Commonwealth link, uh, which will be, will be of enormous assistance to them. And I think that's turned, that is very much uh, the, true for them now. And of course, the same is true because they were later joined by Rwanda in 2009, which had undergone perhaps even more horrors than Mozambique had done. And I hope too that the Commonwealth concept of family and support will make a difference for them. So the fact that states without historical links uh, to the Commonwealth continue to wish to join the organization, I think says a lot about its continued relevance, its <coughs> dynamism and, and beneficial influence, uh, particularly on regional stability. At another level, on um, a slightly different scale, the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, and one of their visits will be Tuvalu, which is the smallest of the Commonwealth realms with a population of barely 10,000. Um, at the risk of distraction, you yet again, Tuvalu is the other half of the Gilbert and Ellis Islands. Kiribati is the other half. I gave them their independence. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was only 30 at the time, but the new president was younger than me. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I get easily distracted. But the Commonwealth <coughs> members uh, can be classified as the small states. Two of shares many of the problems of these countries, not least that uh, the issue of the island status, the, the difficulty of logistics and transport, the ability to earn, all those things give us the same. Those are important things to share and to be able to work through. And I've recently had the opportunity to return to many of those specific countries because a few years ago I became president of the Duke of Edinburgh's Commonwealth Study Conference. And I'm not sure if anybody here has experienced that, but the Commonwealth Study Conference is a leadership development program which is probably as relevant now as it was when my father hosted the first Commonwealth Study Conference in Oxford in 1956. And this was a very much an effort, post-war effort, to reconnect the Commonwealth, both in social, in government, and in business terms. And what is interesting is that by popular demand from the alumni, 
and if the country is concerned, these still continue. And in some of the countries, they run their own um, study conferences. And it's a successful forum, <clears throat> forging links in mid-management level throughout the Commonwealth. And evidence suggests that many of these people later rise to positions of real influence in their countries. But these are real volunteers. Uh, they can be select. They need to be selected because they tend to have more volunteers than they can cope with. And it exposes them to a range of issues, which again underlines the similarities of both problems and solutions, and how important it is to understand that people are the answer. And wherever you go, that will be the answer. And it's working with people, managing people, getting them to buy into the concept which will make the difference. And those Commonwealth Studies programs have really opened people's eyes to understanding what the basics of communication and understanding the similarities, the difference that it can make. So you can argue that despite its long history, or because of it, the Commonwealth remains a thriving organisation which still addresses and has to address some of the most pressing issues facing mankind in the 21st century. We know there are uh, challenges, not just to the Commonwealth, but to every society. But the challenge to the Commonwealth, it's an open, it's a very light touch form of relationship. The challenges are sometimes more difficult to manage. I believe it really is a family in that sense. And families are not, they don't always live in complete harmony. But to make them work, you want to understand the desire to keep talking. And that is what the Commonwealth has continued to do, is to keep talking, keeping those lines of communication open, constantly learning from each other. And perhaps that's what is better understood than it has ever been. Everybody has something to teach somebody else, and it pays us to listen, to continue the talking. So I wish the Institute of Commonwealth Studies well in its role as a focus for the academic study of this unique body. And I do thank them for being the lead in this Diamond Jubilee year to look at this relationship. And I hope many people take advantage of some, what I believe will be some really very, very interesting uh, seminars throughout the year. So thank you. <laughs>